battling above a world in chaos, the Hawker Hurricane strikes with the might of a warrior. On a plane that held the fort, it's the Hawker Hurricane. Maneuvering, adaptive, dependable. It was sturdy, it was simple. Everyone who flew it loved how well it handled. The Hurricane stands against evil with every turn. From the shores of Britain. British citizens could look up into the sky day in, day out, and they could see the hurricane taking the war to the Germans. To the deserts of Africa and beyond. The Hawker hurricane was there to stop the tide of the Axis. During World War II, the Hawker hurricane dominates a bitter fight for freedom. August 1940, the Hawker Hurricane rises above Britain in her most desperate hour. The United Kingdom is on the edge of disaster. In just under a year, Adolf Hitler has captured much of Western Europe. England is his next target. So in the summer of 1940, there were fairly dark days in the United Kingdom. Our intelligence had not warned us that the German military machine was going to so swiftly take the continent with such levels of casualties. We knew we were the only country left in Europe that could effectively halt this German onslaught. For the second day, over 2,000 Nazi aircraft head straight for the country's southern cliffs. Their goal, annihilate the Royal Air Force and clear the way for a full-scale invasion of the British Isles. With only 640 British fighters ready for combat, the German Luftwaffe outnumbers the RAF four to one. Everything is on the line. What's at stake as far as they are concerned is their homes. Yes, they were afraid. They have every right to. They were up against some very experienced opponents. Britain's protectors, the famed Supermarine Spitfire, and the resilient Hawker Hurricane. The Spitfire has a prominent reputation, but the Hurricane could become Britain's unsung hero. As far as the Battle of Britain goes, uh, the Hawker Hurricane might be a case of the right plane at the right time. At the time of the Supermarine Spitfire's debut, it had pretty much captured the imaginations of everyone with its sleek lines. The British could produce twice as many Hurricanes as they could Spitfires. and. Britain's ability to make good its losses was as important as the performance of the planes themselves. For every one Spitfire, there are two Hurricanes facing the brunt of Germany's wrath. Supporting the RAF fighters is an extensive radar network. Besides the airplanes, the greatest advantage the British had over the Germans was their line of radar to report in the altitude, the numbers, the types to uh, central command from which it could process that intelligence and see to it that they unleashed the right squadrons to the right place at the right time. August 16th, RAF Boscombe Down, Wiltshire, England. The hurricane pilots of Squadron 249 wait for their call to action. They could be waiting for hours before they heard that bell. All sorts of emotions could be going through their mind, from boredom, through fear, through will I equip myself well? How will I perform against the enemy? Suddenly, the bell rings. The enemy is coming. They've been fighting against the Luftwaffe for over a month. 
they're exhausted, running on fumes with no sign of a break. A 23-year-old flight lieutenant knows the stakes as he battles war fatigue for the first time. James Brindley Nicholson joined the Royal Air Force in 1936. He was a fairly experienced peacetime pilot, but he was not an experienced wartime pilot. So for him, the concept of engaging the enemy, although he trained for it, was still very much new to him. 1.45 p.m., 17,000 feet. Nicholson steers the red section trio of a 12-man formation. Suddenly, he spots three enemy aircraft sailing towards Southampton. As he drops to investigate, he flies into a trap. There's a Messerschmitt BF-109 on Nicholson's tail. The pilot dives, but can't escape the 109. He feels the explosive punch of four cannon shells detonate beneath him as his fuel tank catches fire. Searing heat now rises into his cockpit. So he would have gone from a position of thinking he was in an advantage to total confusion. He knew he'd just been shot at. He didn't know where from, but he knew the stakes were not in his favor. Wounded in the foot and eye, Nicholson needs critical medical attention. Racing towards the British countryside, he grabs for his hatch to bail until he spots a German BF-110 fighter in front of him. He's in pain, he's confused, he's scared, but as soon as that enemy airplane appears in front of him, there's no doubt in his mind, he's got to engage it, he's got to kill it. The hurricane pilot slams his canopy and beelines it straight for the BF-110. Nicholson is determined to stop the Luftwaffe at all costs. The logical thing at this point, if you're still alive to do so, is bail the hell out. Something inside him just had to do something. And it just overcame even the knowledge that he was on fire. And he just had to stick with it as long as he could. Nicholson gives everything his body and machine have left. From just 200 yards away, he takes a deep breath and lines up his target. Behind me is a Hawker Hurricane, the backbone of the Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain. Part of what made the Hawker Hurricane so deadly was its fearsome armament. What we have here in the wing are four British 303 caliber machine guns replicated on the other side of the aircraft for a total of eight. These machine guns were aimed slightly inboard to create the ability for the shots from these guns to intersect at a point between 300 and 500 yards out ahead of the aircraft. The Hurricane's weapon platform is very accurate. Its downside, the aircraft only holds 15 seconds of ammunition. The Hawker Hurricane pilots that flew during the Battle of Britain became exemplars of the act of preserving the limited ammunition on board the aircraft. Running out of ammunition during a dogfight was a death sentence, and so they became very conscious of the amount of ammunition that they were expending, and training reinforced the need to be judicious with your shots. In the skies over England, Nicholson unleashes a thousand rounds. The shots find their mark. Smoke trails from the routed 110's wings as it snakes toward the ground. Now, he must make his own exit from the sweltering inferno overtaking his cockpit. Once you've jumped out of a flaming airplane and you've been burned, you're still in survival mode. And it's only after you're floating to Earth that you notice the pain. So here's Nicholson, wounded and burned. Now the pain is starting to set in. Now it can, he can afford to let it set in. But on the ground, Nicholson faces a new threat. Looking up at the tattered pilot is a group of local defense volunteers. They're armed and ready to strike. A man they think is German. 
The local defense force was typically people that were not able to go and enter the, the regular army, the Navy or the Air Force. That said, they were very committed to the defense of the country. They used whatever armaments they could have. Sometimes it was pitchforks, sometimes it was old rifles or pistols. In southern England, the defense force is on edge, and they're not taking any prisoners. At the beginning of the Battle of Britain in 1940, the majority of airplanes over the United Kingdom were German. They knew that the pilots were coming down would be armed, so they didn't want to be caught on the hop, and they wanted to be ready to, um, to engage and do their duty. When they see a pilot dropping in a parachute, nervous instinct kicks in. The guards fire, with Nicholson's life in the balance. August 1940, Battle of Britain. RAF pilot James Brindley Nicholson destroys a German BF-110 while taking damage to his hurricane. Parachuting to English soil, he then takes fire from his own home guard, mistaking him for the enemy. Nicholson lands with multiple wounds, but an unshaken resolve. It's just the kind of grit Britain needs. The Royal Air Force needed to shoot down more airplanes than we were losing at the time. We needed to shoot them down at a ratio of four to one. If you look at what Nicholson did that day, he put personal sacrifice right at the bottom of the pile. For his heroic efforts, Nicholson receives the Victoria Cross from King George VI. It's Britain's highest honor, bestowed for valor. That you're willing to risk your life under circumstances like that, that somewhat elevates the valor to a higher plane. Nicholson's victory is an incredible feat, delivered from Britain's essential workhorse that boasts its own enterprising path to triumph. January 1933, out of the ashes of a global depression, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler clinches an iron grip on the German Republic. The dangerous new Fuhrer brazenly defies World War I disarmament orders and rapidly begins mobilizing German forces. Hitler's rearmament strategy is fascinating. He's really looking at putting together a large land army. But flying top cover for that land army will be a powerful air force of dive bombers and, and fighters and two engine bombers that can range deeply into the uh, enemy's rear areas and disrupt supply lines and headquarters. Across the channel, the British Air Force relies on proven technology, biplanes. But these planes have one major disadvantage, speed. Biplane design was just what pilots wanted in World War I. It was maneuverable. You could tuck and turn, but the biplanes of World War I weren't very fast. Advanced engines now allow planes to fly at groundbreaking speeds. But while biplanes are stable and maneuverable, they're limited to how fast they can fly. When a biplane reaches over 200 miles per hour, its double set of wings causes drag and makes the plane unstable. In Germany, the Luftwaffe soon realized a single set of wings, or monoplane, creates the balance between stability and speed. The Germans picked up on that and designed monoplane bombers. That was a real threat to Britain, and the RAF needed a faster monoplane interceptor the Germans' bombers are built around new, fast engines that can easily outpower the RAF's aging biplanes. A modern war looms in Europe. The British must refuel their strapped economy and rebuild their air force with a new air fleet. At Hawker Aircraft, aeronautical expert Sidney Cam has a cost-effective solution. Cam turns to his trusted Hawker Fury biplane and gives it an innovative makeover. He retains the wooden framing and fabric fuselage of his Fury, 
but replaces its double set of wings with a single set. He encloses the cockpit, then widens and retracts the landing gear. The result is a halfway house between the old and the new, perfect for a war on limited resources. The Hawker Hurricane was largely constructed from a mixture of wood and fabric. This is known as conventional aircraft construction. And at the time, it meant that the airplane was much faster to build, as well as much easier to repair. This meant that Hurricanes were able to be repaired by their ground crews when aircraft like the Spitfire were being written off for similar battle damage. It also meant that the Hurricane could be produced in quantity much faster because the infrastructure to build this type of aircraft fuselage was well and truly in place in England, whereas all metal aircraft fuselages were a relatively new advancement. Inside its adaptable frame is the Hurricane's greatest asset, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. With the Merlin engine, the Hawker Hurricane became the first monoplane fighter to go faster than 300 miles per hour. It was the first of the fighters to go into production. That meant that by late 1939, the RAF had 600 Hurricanes in the inventory. That would turn out to be a crucial margin. In 1937, the RAF incorporates the fast, easy-to-produce Hurricane into service. Two years later, there are 16 Hurricane squadrons across Britain, just in time for chaos. September 1st, 1939, the Nazis sweep through Poland and decimate air and ground forces. In the Polish campaign, the German Air Force did it all. It flew direct support missions against Polish forces on the ground. It ranged behind the defenses to disrupt Polish supply and logistics. The Germans call this operational air war because it's active in the entire range of operational space against the Polish army. The Nazis seize Poland. Two days later, Great Britain declares war on Germany. France quickly follows suit. Just 20 years after the First World War, Europe sinks back toward the bounds of hell. The United Kingdom sends an expeditionary force of 390,000 troops to France. They line the Belgian and German borders and a heavy fortification called the Maginot Line. It was a very well fortified uh, border area full of sophisticated underground bunkers and guns and passageways that in, in essence would seal up the French border. Above, outdated British gladiators and just four hurricane squadrons search the skies for the Luftwaffe. But to the Allies' surprise, Germany delays invasion. For eight months, hurricane pilots and ground troops settle into a long, uneasy wait for the enemy. May 10th, 1940, Northern France. Dennis David of 87 Squadron flies a routine reconnaissance mission when he receives a nasty shock. German bombers are now attacking his air base. It's part of a staggering offensive, nearly 3,000 aircraft strong. The sense of shock that the German bombers are attacking his airfield, they're in real danger. David and his wingman Gary Noel quickly return to camp where they spot trees they've never seen before. Suddenly, David realizes they're not trees, but bombs. Well, this gave him uh, an idea that they were in a serious war at this point, and that at stake was his own home field. They were committed now to uh, an us or them situation. David and Noel pull up and head towards the Maginot Line. 
Moments later, they spot a group of heavily armed Heinkel 111s, Germany's premier bomber. There was a uh, machine gun on top of the fuselage, another one manned on the ventral part, and a third in the glazed nose firing forward, and that was supposed to cover all angles. The Heinkels fire from all sides of their aircraft. David and Noel split up and weave between the bombers. David must make a quick choice. There are two ways of dealing with an enemy bomber. You can either uh, take the trouble to fire back at the uh, rear machine gunner's position, or you go for the pilot, or you go for the engine. He aims for the twin engines, firing a short burst as the bomber swerves to avoid tracer. Racking his aircraft, David relies on a tight turn radius to dodge the bomber's arsenal. The RAF pilot only has 15 seconds of ammunition in his hurricane. He has to make this shot count. David unloads his eight machine guns. Bullseye. His Heinkel is hit. That same day, he claims a Dornier DO-17 and helps shoot down a second. David returns to his base unharmed and to a war that has finally begun. They knew it was coming. Now it's finally here. And there's a sense of grim determination to see this thing through. Soon, more hurricane squadrons appear in the skies over France. But despite the increase in new arrivals, there aren't enough hurricanes to hold the Germans. The RAF can't stop the German blitzkrieg in the air or on the ground. The French thought that they could easily hold their own against the Germans. What they didn't imagine was that the Germans would end up doing very little to punch through the Maginot line. They went around it. With Blitzkrieg, the German forces are pressing forward, and France is right on the edge. May 1940, Germany blitzes through the French countryside. Above, the British Hawker Hurricane struggles to contain the Luftwaffe. The Hurricane pilots shoot down hundreds of planes, but it's simply not enough. In spite of the undoubted successes that were being had all around by the Hurricane squadrons, in the face of the overall onslaught of Blitzkrieg, there was simply nothing they could do to save France. Of 452 hurricanes sent to the continent, only 66 returned to Britain. The Battle of France drains the Royal Air Force of pilots and planes. The campaign in France is a disaster on all levels for the Western powers, but I would say especially in the air. There's not enough hurricanes and there's virtually no Spitfires, and that's because the British are fighting the campaign in France with the kind of one eye behind them. Britain has long feared facing Hitler's powerful military alone. Now, their worst fears are realized. They need reinforcement. It arrives in the form of refugee pilots who have escaped from Poland with vengeance on their minds. But the Polish had seen the Germans sweep through their country. They'd lost friends and fellow countrymen. They were now in the United Kingdom, and they were very keen to take the fight back to Germany. The British welcome nearly 150 Polish pilots into their air fleet, dividing them into several groups. One of the most seasoned is 303 Squadron. So the Polish pilots were a great match for the hurricane because the Polish pilots were bringing experience in attacking bomber formations, which the RAF realized was going to be a crucial piece of the Battle of Britain. In the summer of 1940, over a 1,000 bombers fly toward London. Their mission, bomb England into submission before launching a Nazi invasion. The United Kingdom is the last free allied nation standing in Western Europe. The battle for Britain has begun. 
August 31st, 1940, 16,000 feet. Six hurricane pilots of 303 Squadron's A flight are on their first day of war south of London. They soon spot Dorniers, guarded by a swarm of Messerschmitt BF-109s. With escort protection, they can't isolate the bombers unless they challenge the fighters first. The ME-109 is a formidable fighter. It's got the speed, the power, the agility. It's got a more advanced engine than the Hurricane. The ME-109 could fly faster, it could fly higher. So its pilot, as long as it could see the enemy, could engage and disengage at will. But today, the Hurricanes have a favorable advantage, the sun. Quite often, it's the fighter pilot that can see the opposing enemy that can dictate the fight. When you're coming out of the sun, it's almost impossible to see the enemy bearing down on you. So as a fighter pilot, you always want to attack from up sun. So you'll position your formation high and above the enemy so you can come down with the tactical advantage of surprise, speed, and energy. Squadron leader Ronald Kellett and his two Polish wingmen charged the enemy formation in a sneak attack. The 109s dive, but with a prevailing altitude and turn radius, the Hurricanes easily lock onto the fighters. The RAF pilots fire, giving the Germans a dose of their own tactics. So the Polish 303 pilots attack the ME 109s from very close range. It's a real payoff for the tactics they've learned from Blitzkrieg and from their training with the RAF. The 303 pilots are able to shoot down the ME-109s. The rear of A flight won't be outdone. The trio spots three more German fighters and speed towards the enemy. Now the second group of Hurricanes attacks. They take out the fourth and fifth ME-109, but the sixth man escapes. And in comes the final 303 pilot, number six chasing number six. Lieutenant Henneberg breaks from his hurricane formation and races after the final Messerschmitt. He chases the German pilot all the way to the English Channel, desperately hoping no other German fighters lock onto his tail. Over the water, Henneberg pushes his slower hurricane to its limit. With just enough speed, he fires shattering rounds and claims 303's sixth victory of the day. A month later, the group becomes one of the top scoring squadrons in the Battle of Britain. So 303 Squadron put together one of the highest kill records of any squadron in the Battle of Britain, shooting down 126 aircraft. So 303 Squadron proved that the Hurricane was a great weapon. It also proved that squadrons with pilots from Europe and from the Empire would be a great asset to this global war. The fight for Britain rages for two more months. With the help of pilots from allied nations and the Commonwealth, Hitler finally abandons his hope of invasion. The Battle of Britain is a huge triumph for the Royal Air Force, its pilots, and the indispensable Hawker Hurricane. During the Battle of Britain, when they were producing two hurricanes for every Spitfire, that very fact in itself was to be a decisive factor in the outcome of the battle. It was not as good a fighter as the Messerschmitt ME-109, but it was good enough to make the Germans dismiss it at their own peril. The British probably couldn't have won the Battle of Britain without it. But just as the homeland is secured, new trouble brews in the far reaches of Britain's empire. Once more, the RAF turns to its force of war-torn hurricanes soon stretching its reserves to the breaking point. December 1941. 
The fight in Europe has taken a heavy toll on British forces. Now, they face additional opposition in a new theater of war. Japan aligns with Germany and attacks the U.S. at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Then they sweep British and American assets across the Pacific. The Japanese overrun Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Malaysia. Their goal? Resources to maintain a wartime economy. The expansion of, of Japan in late 1941 and into 42 was that the island nation uh, had absolutely no natural resources of their own. Coal and oil were of particular and vital importance to run a modern economy, which the Japanese did not have. British allies and colonies in Asia face invasion. Once more, the Royal Air Force calls up the hurricane, now desperately low in supply. 1942 is when Britain's defense needs and Britain's defense means get hopelessly out of whack. Britain is barely hanging on to its own independence against the German-dominated Europe. And the notion that it would be able to defend the Malay Peninsula or Singapore is just going to be a very, very difficult notion for anyone to entertain. February 1942, Japanese forces rip through Malaysia and crush Singapore. Allied forces fall back to the Dutch colony of Indonesia. The island of Sumatra is home to 258 Squadron, with only a handful of hurricanes. The priority for the RAF has been the war in Europe. And so by February 1942, there are only 14 hurricanes at the base in Indonesia. They have to make every mission count. February 14th, 15,000 feet. Hurricane pilot Sergeant Terence Kelly is on a mission to locate and destroy a Japanese convoy. As he flies toward the Java Sea, he's without a working radio, a result of meager tactical resources in the Pacific. You know, there was almost a kind of rule of thumb. The further away you got from London, the less likely you were to be resourced. And I think that's precisely what's happening to the uh, British force in East Asia in early 1942. Through the clouds, Kelly detects Japan's newest aircraft, the Mitsubishi A6M-0. He signals his flight to follow, but only one hurricane responds. The young sergeant speeds toward the Zeros, but quickly finds he's no match for the Imperial Navy's frontline fighter. For Kelly, this is a big moment. He's not sure what the capabilities of that Japanese Zero really are. And it's going to be a rude shock, because the Japanese Zero is one of the very few planes that can outturn the hurricane. The Zero quickly attaches to Kelly's tail and fires a burst. Kelly quickly realizes his one choice is to get down on the deck. Kelly dives toward the dense jungle. If he can't outrun the Zero in open sky, he'll try to lose him in the trees. Diving down is a crazy, desperate tactic, but Kelly has just one option. Use his experience at low-level flight to try to fly his hurricane so low against the jungle background that the Japanese Zero loses sight of Kelly's hurricane and breaks off the attack. Kelly frantically weaves between the trees, watching fire tracers zip past his wings. Then he looks back. The Zero is gone. His relief is overrun by fear. He's desperately low on fuel. Kelly races toward the closest airfield and lands in shock. His runway is completely abandoned. An hour ago, this base was filled with busy ground crew now, total silence. Suddenly, another plane comes in for a landing. 
It's a fellow Hurricane pilot. Kelly returns to base, and another Hurricane shows up and lands at the same time. Both of them realize their radios aren't working, and the airfield is empty. It's because they've been given an order to evacuate. Japanese paratroopers have landed, and they're headed towards the airfield. Gunfire blares in the distance. The Japanese are advancing. The hurricane pilots have to escape the airfield now. The Englishmen jump back in their planes and try to restart their cooling engines. With relief, their hurricanes roar to life and limp 50 miles to the next airfield. The pair lands with just two gallons of fuel. They're safe, but not for long. Sumatra's defense is breached. By April, Indonesia and Squadron 258 tragically fall to Japan. It only gets worse for 258 Squadron through the spring of 1942. They call 258 the squadron that vanished. Many are killed, and some, like Kelly, end up as prisoners of war. 5,000 miles away, the Axis continues to apply worldwide pressure. In the Mediterranean, they threaten to capture Britain's lifeline to the east, the Suez Canal. The British race to defend North Africa. But to maintain operations in the theater, they need to get fuel to the African staging ground of Malta. The route? A dangerous path through the Mediterranean Sea, heavily defended by enemy aircraft. Triumph hinges on the Royal Navy and second-hand aircraft that have only been seaworthy for two years. The odds of success are terrifying. August 1942, British fighters fly above the Mediterranean. They're on a mission to protect a convoy delivering provisions to Malta. These are sea hurricanes that have taken an unconventional path to the Royal Navy. Five years previously, the Royal Air Force ran all military flight operations in Britain. But with war approaching, it's clear Britain needs aircraft over land and at sea. In 1938, the Royal Navy takes control of the fleet air arm. They have powerful aircraft carriers. Now they need a trusted aircraft. The Royal Navy was looking for an aircraft that could serve on board, and they ended up looking at the hurricane as a stopgap measure until something else was designed and better came along. The Royal Navy modifies the hurricane into the Sea Hurricane. Its preeminent variant boasts four 20 millimeter cannons and an upgraded engine. The development comes just in time. By summer 1942, the strategic Mediterranean stronghold of Malta needs urgent resupply of food and aircraft fuel. Fortress Malta is a strategic asset in the Mediterranean. It is where the Axis uh, are so keen to get those islands out of our hands because they know that if we can't resupply those islands, we can't keep our forces resupplied in North Africa. In August, the Allies send a massive convoy through the Mediterranean in a mission known as Operation Pedestal. August 12th, 9 a.m., 14 merchant ships sail through risky waters, surrounded by a flotilla of destroyers, cruisers, and four pivotal aircraft carriers. On HMS Indomitable, Naval Air Squadron 880 fires up their sea hurricanes. RJ Dickie Cork is on deck. Dickie Cork is a senior pilot on 880 Naval Air Squadron. The Navy at that stage had whole squadrons of pilots involved in this operation that hadn't even landed on an aircraft carrier. So he bought great experience, great knowledge, and was a wonderful asset to help lead his squadron. 
As his unit takes to the clouds, German and Italian planes dominate the sky. There were enemy aircraft coming from all directions. His duty was to protect that convoy. Cork's group of hurricanes aim for a wave of Junkers 88 bombers. 880 Squadron charges into the Germans' formation and forces them to scatter. But an enemy bomber powers past the naval pilots, charging toward the convoy. Desperate, Cork turns his nimble hurricane and relentlessly fires. Dickie Cork is defending his home when he is defending HMS Indomitable, and everyone aboard it. So when a JU-88 is showing up on a uh, glide diving run, you're going to want to do all you can to shoot it down. The Junkers barrages cork with defensive shells. But the bomber is no match for the Sea Hurricane's explosive cannon rounds and supercharged engine. Cork blasts the JU-88 and watches it crash to the sea. Then, against overwhelming odds, Cork shoots down four more planes that afternoon, becoming the Royal Navy's only ace in a day. To become an ace in a day, that happened oh so rarely. And it only ever happened to one naval pilot, and that was him. So it was hugely significant. The Allies lose nine of their 14 merchant ships. But Operation Pedestal is a strategic success. On August 15th, SS Ohio delivers vital oil to sustain Allied forces in Malta and North Africa. To everybody's surprise, practically a wash, Ohio made it into uh, to Malta with its precious fuel, a factor which pretty much kept Malta and remaining hurricanes going just long enough to see the Axis defeated in the entire Mediterranean. Three months later, Hurricane Mark II Ds support the Allies as they wage a bilateral attack on Axis forces in North Africa. By 1943, an Allied victory in the region is imminent. The sea and land hurricanes prove to be an outstanding tag team. Their results stamp the aircraft as one of Britain's most versatile fighters. It wasn't the flashiest fighter of World War II, but it was dependable. And in the hurricane, you could take the fight to the enemy. The RAF operates the hurricane through the war and retires it from service in 1947. Today, it is remembered as a hero that bolstered Britain in its finest hour. The hurricane to me represents the best of British. In 1940, the UK stood alone largely against the onslaught of the Luftwaffe and the German armed forces. Yet the hurricane withstood that. It gave the pilots confidence to get in it day in, day out when they were tired, emotionally drained, physically exhausted, and scared to go into fight. The Hawker Hurricane was there to fight against Germany and Japan and strike the first blows for freedom. Adaptable, aggressive, accomplished. The Hurricane is the warrior that wrestled for freedom and won.